We've used about half the oil in the Earth's crust that is accessible by conventional oil drilling techniques. What's going to happen? Will we run out? Will we conserve? Or will we make more oil accessible? We'll do all three of these things. How can we make more oil accessible? As oil becomes more scarce, the price will go up. This will finance better technologies for drilling oil. With these better technologies, more oil will be accessible. This sounds great, but we should be aware of some of the consequences of this. There'll be small economic consequences in drilling the oil itself, but there'll be many external consequences in the form of pollution, human safety, and political tensions. Three of the new technologies that I'll talk about are hydraulic fracturing or fracking, tar sands, and deep water drilling. So what is oil? It's a mixture of hydrocarbons. Here we see octane or C8H18 with eight carbons and 18 hydrogens. Now it's not always in a straight line. It can be branched. It can be uh, circular. And there can be many different numbers of carbons. What we find is that the larger molecules have a higher melting point and boiling point. They're more viscous and the larger molecules have a higher density as well as a, high, a slightly higher energy density. So in a barrel of crude oil, you will have a large mixture of many of these hydrocarbons with many different chain lengths. And so given 100 barrels of crude oil, you might produce six barrels of petroleum gas which is like propane and methane, natural gas, it has a very low boiling point, much lower than gasoline, for instance, with 5 to 12 carbons, and boils at much higher temperatures. Kerosene is a larger hydrocarbon, and diesel is much larger and more viscous than gasoline with a higher boiling point. And then you have your very heavy oils all the way down to bitumen, which is tar. That's the tar in the tar sands of Canada and also the tar that we make our roads from. So how do we separate these different hydrocarbons from each other? We make use of the fact that the larger molecules have a higher boiling point. When the crude oil comes in, we vaporize it all, all except the stuff that doesn't vaporize because it has such a high boiling point. And that's the bitumen that we make roads and roofing out of. All the rest, we slowly cool at different levels and at each level, a new fraction, what's called fraction of hydrocarbon, will condense. Each fraction being somewhat lighter than the fraction before. Very heavy fuel oil can be used as bunker fuels for ships. They can use as very heavy, dirty fuel because they're usually far from people, far from cities, way out in the ocean. This is, however, a problem for ports because these ships need energy in order to do in order to conduct their activities while they're in port and the resulting pollutants are very detrimental to people living around the port city. Small hydrocarbons like gasoline and jet fuel are much more valuable than bitumen. So there's a technique called cracking whereby in the presence of a catalyst with a lot of heat you can break up these large hydrocarbons of bitumen and make smaller, lighter, more valuable fuels. All of this is very energy intensive as a result, when you burn one gallon of gas, you're responsible for more than just that energy because a significant amount of energy had to be consumed in order to bring you that gallon of gas. And the emissions that result from this processing, we call upstream emissions, which you find the carbon dioxide that you emit from the tailpipe of your car is only part of the emissions you're responsible for. How many upstream emissions you're responsible for depends on the technologies that were used to bring this gasoline out of the ground to you. Here we see world oil production as a function of year in billions of barrels per year. We can see a relatively steady increase up until now and several projections in the future. This one if the earth has 1.8 trillion barrels of accessible crude. And this curve if the earth has 2.6 trillion barrels of accessible crude. Each one of these models has its own estimate of the peak year. So for 1.8 trillion barrels, we've already peaked at about 2005. 
and the 2.6 trillion barrels we shouldn't peak until about 2020. Here's a similar graph with each country separate. So for instance, here is Texas and here is the total United States, the lower 48 United States with Alaska thrown in right here. So this is United States oil production. You can see the little bump we get from Alaska. You also notice that the United States started very early in the game in oil production and the other countries came later and that it seems as though the United States is running out. It's interesting to note that the World Energy Outlook published by the United States Department of Energy's Energy Information Administration has a contrasting and comparably very rosy prediction compared to the rest of the scientific community. It's for this reason that while I have great respect for the data that the EIA presents, I'm rather skeptical of what their predictions are. How did the scientific community come up with this prediction of decreased production over the years to come? We can make these predictions by looking at the rate of production, and this is the rate at which we pull oil out of the ground, and compare it with the rate at which we discover new oil. And we can see that the, the time of great oil discovery was in the 1970s. This is world oil extraction as a function of year. And so disturbingly, more recently, we can see that we are extracting oil at a much greater rate than we're discovering it. So it's very reasonable to estimate that our production is going to have to drop off after some time. What we anticipate is the delay between the peak discovery and the peak production is on the order of 35 to 40 years. This is the corresponding curve for the oil production of the United States, the lower 48 states. In 1957, King Hubbard, who at the time was working for Shell Oil, noticed that there was a decrease in the rate of oil discovery. However, the consumption continued to grow. Using these data, he was able to predict a peak year in the early 70s, assuming a shift of 35 years from peak discovery to peak production. So how good was his prediction? Again, he made the prediction in 1957. His prediction is in yellow triangles. And the red triangles is total US production. But remember this bump? This is from Alaska. So if we discard that and go with the lower 48, we can see King Hubbard's prediction was extraordinarily good. Additionally, the reason that King Hubbard underestimated the production of the United States was not because there was more accessible oil than he anticipated, but because in this period of time, this 20 years or so, the technologies developed that were able to extract oil that was before then not accessible. It is also important to look at the production curves of other countries. For instance, Mexico, who is an exporter to the United States, is not going to be able to export for much longer because we can see they're, they're producing more oil than they're discovering so how does this scarcity affect the price of oil? Here we see a graph as a function of year, the price of a barrel of oil. We want to look at the yellow graph because this is in inflation adjusted dollars or in 2008 dollars. And so what we see is the price of oil is the largest it's been in recent history. The only time it came close was during the oil embargoes of the late 1970s. OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, embargoing the United States, refusing to sell oil to us. This resulted in an acute shortage in the United States with significant economic repercussions. We quote Thomas Friedman, this is not your parents' energy crisis. And what he's referring to is this shortage and this crisis was very short and resulted from a squeezing of the bottleneck of oil because of political means. But that's not what's causing this increase in price. This increase, increase in price is a result of market forces because the supply can no longer meet demand and the price is rising. It's very unlikely that the price of crude is going to drop again like it did after the oil crisis of the 1970s. We can see some of the political results in reports of geopolitical tensions. You can imagine when the president of the most powerful country in the world goes and demands or begs the leading exporter of oil to increase their production. 
they respond with no, we won't. You can imagine that this, this must be an indication of a shortage of accessibility. We can see the effect of this increase in price. Although U.S. oil production has been dropping, the number of active rigs is increasing considerably because of the increased price of oil. We can look at the domestic production of oil again and the domestic consumption. The difference between these two curves is the amount of oil that is imported into the United States. And because of this acute rise in price recently, what we're seeing is a slight increase in production that may increase and a slight decrease in consumption. We can see an increase in production if we look at supply side management, how can we produce more? Because the scarcity that produces a high price enables technologies that makes more oil accessible. We can also look at a decrease in demand. On the demand side, the increased price results in more conservation. 